pray. Amen. Okay, so this morning we are going to start in the book of Jude. We're going to do spend the uh, next uh, couple, three weeks in the book of Jude. Book, small book, right before the book of Revelation. You know, you, you think about your perceptions of Jude, and one is that, well, it's right before Revelation, right? As we begin the book of Jude, and as I prepared for this class, some things really st stood out to me. This is a short book, but it's an intense book. It's a, a book that um, is full of just earnest imperatives. It's a full of, of phrases and words that are just very intent. The writer of this book, and we'll get into talking about the, the, that in just a moment, but the writer of the book is very intent on a few things. He believes that the faith is in danger. The things are occurring that are going to damage the faith, and it's not going to damage the faith, but it would damage the people that we're trying to hold to the faith, right? When we say damage the faith, it means it damages the people that are trying to hold to the faith. It would contaminate or pollute. When something becomes contaminated, what happens to it? I'm sorry? It can grow like, like bread, but that's not really the angle that I'm going at here. Lynn? Lynn? Okay, it's not pure. That's where I was going, Janet. So this, uh, it's not saying Janet's incorrect. She just had a different look in the way of, of that. But, but the idea here is that Liz Lynn point, it's not pure. So if we need to have pure ingredients for us to grow and to get closer to the Lord, what happens when we start to take things in that change that faith or the faith? What happens to us? We're not pure. Are we going to have to be pure in order to grow closer to God? Well, we are. So you say, well, Rob, I make mistakes. And if I ask you to hold up your hand, if you make mistakes and fall short, probably everyone in here would hold up their hands. So how do you mean that how do I become pure? How do we become pure? Mary says the Word of God. So if we're holding to something that's pure, the faith, the Word of God, delivered once for all, and we're going to see a little bit more of that, then we can draw closer to God. Can it make a difference in our lives? Read it. Is the Word of God. Yep, yeah, that's right. So the idea here is that the Word of God is what we are all about. If that Word becomes contaminated, then the result is not what it needs to be. Then we fall short too. If we hold to something that's different. Well, here we're going to see some concepts too that people have crept in. When something creeps into your house, you, you need to call Sean Lunsford. Right? But when something creeps in, does it announce its presence right away? Do those brown recluse spiders in your attic announce their presence to you? Not until you're up there looking for something and one of them falls on your head. Right? Yeah. But this idea here is that the writer, Jude, he indicates that persons have crept in. Well, when someone creeps in, do you notice it immediately? No. No, they just kind of blend in. It's a little different perspective than the, the books of 2nd and 3rd John. In 2nd John, what did we see? We saw that, that people had left and went out. But it's the same concept because... 
both are in error. When someone has crept in, they, they kind of come in and they look like one of us, one of them. And so the damage that could be done there could be significant because they came in unnoticed. If you don't notice something, oftentimes you get overwhelmed if you're not careful. So the, the writer here, um, were, he had a, a warning for them. The doctrine that these folks were espousing, it had bad morals. In fact, in fact it was even abominable. When something is abominable, what is that? It's not the abominable snowman. Hmm. Abominable. Well, overpowering. That's a one way. That's a that's an element of it, right? Detestable. Something that is opposite of God. It opposes God. Now these people had a doctrine. And we're going to see here um, that this doctrine, maybe it sounds good. You ever had anything that sounded good, but it wasn't really all that great once you got to looking at it? Yeah, of course you have. So this idea here is that these people, they had things that were coming in that were detestable and that they had bad morals. Uh, and principally, they disowned Jesus Christ. They disowned Jesus Christ. Remember what we talked about back in, in uh, 2 John about the, the folks that were in that period, the Gnostics, and what their beliefs were? You see, those folks, whether or not Jude is writing about the same exact group of people, the same result occurs. Though. These are all people that disavow Jesus Christ. If we have a religion that disowns Jesus Christ and the Word, how valuable to it, to that is it? How valuable is that to us? It's not. There's of no value. It'll cost you. It'll cost you eternally. And this is where, again, you come back to Jude, and he has a he has a writing here. When you read through the book of Jude, it doesn't take you very long. But you're left with this impression that, wow, this is, this is really serious. This is, this, is really, this is really important. Well, here, um, uh, we know that the fate, uh, some are, uh, um, so the fate of these unbelievers, we know that it is known, right? Unbelief, people that deceive, we know all their fates. But yet these people, they continue to espouse this doctrine. And we're going to see that. We'll look at it a little closer. What happens to us if we say something long enough? We start believing it. So these people, in their error, they've said this long enough, and they've kept saying it, they've kept saying it, and they've kept saying it, and they've convinced themselves that they are right. Are we that same way? Do we run the risk when we fall into a trap? We say it long enough and long enough and long enough, and the next thing you know, we start to believe the error. This isn't, um, this isn't intended to be any sort of a political statement. But there are things that are being said in society today that 15, 20 years ago, I would not have believed them to be accepted norms of society. I can't believe some of the things that our society is embracing. So don't convince yourself for a moment that you're not susceptible to this. Because if these people have crept in unnoticed, maybe the message that they're saying is just at first, just a little altered, just a little bit of a deception, and you trust them. They're good people. Oh, yeah, we've known them for several years. And maybe it's just a little here and a little there. And the next thing you know, the fate is sealed. 
These folks are also talking here, we're going to talk about someone that's a dreamer. And I don't mean that someone that dreams of being president of the United States. That's not what I mean. In this context, visions, spirituality. Well, you know, you know, I'm a I'm a little more spiritual than you are probably. You know, uh, God, he he spoke to me last night. Now, if I came up to you and told you that, you'd probably cart me out of here. You should. But here's this idea that these people, because of their dreams, because of their visions, they were claiming to have a higher spirituality. One time, Judy was in college over at Lincoln years and years ago, and she had a classmate, and, and he moved here from somewhere else and had, had his family, he, you know, they moved his family, he moved his family here. Do you know why he moved here to go to Lincoln University? Why do you think he moved here? Because God told him to do that in a dream. God told him, you know, I don't know about that, but, but it was the idea that God told him to do that in a dream. I don't know. You tell me, was he playing into that? Maybe there is a scholarship, maybe not. But the bottom line, it was a great excuse, wasn't it? And what if he really believed that? You see, this could be serious. If we start uh, uh, going around here and the one that has the greatest dream is going to be the most spiritual, that's where the insight's going to be. Where does our insight into God come from? Is it about dreams and revelations and, and visions? It's about the truth. It comes from his word. And that's what Jude's point here in this book is. We shouldn't pay attention to all these things that are going out. These claims of superiority. If we had... Uh, the spiritual division of the church, and they sat over here. Would that create a division? Now, you know, we're all over here, right? We're the, we're the visioners over here, right? So here's this idea that these things come up and they create divisions. Back in that time, there were certain gifts that were given to some, right? Right? They had prophecy, and, and they had other types of gifts that they, were, that they would use, right? Well, what could that lead one to do? You could take on an air of superiority, could you not? You could take on and say, well, I, I, my gift is the best thing going, and so I'm, I'm going to be over like this. Rita? Rita? That's right. And what they've done to it is they've bought into that. Some of these people have bought into that very concept and that notion. And Jude is saying, watch out. Pay attention to the Word of God. Because when you get all these people wanting to create divisions and, and levels and, and based upon certain things, we create this situation that is detestable. It's abominable to the Lord. Okay, well I've probably talked enough about that. We won't have too many sermons today. Let's go ahead and open to the book of Jude and let's, let's talk. Let's read the scripture and we're going to read the uh, first couple of verses here. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. Jude, 
How does Jude refer to himself as? A bondservant. Well, who else is he? Brother of James. Well, let's go back here if you would. And let's look at let's look at Matthew chapter 13. Because I want to want you to look at something, and, and there's going to be it's an importance here on the ordering of the words. He's placing emphasis on what's important. In Matthew chapter 13, here in verse 55, we'll see a little bit more about the who Jude is. This is an, an, a, um, an event, a time where Jesus is teaching and visiting Nazareth. And remember, that's where he grew up. Verse 55, is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? His brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas. Another word for Judas is Jude. All right. Over in Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, starting in verse 3. Same event, slightly different accounting. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? Are not his sisters with us? And they took offense at him. Here's Jesus. He comes back to Nazareth, and he's teaching. And what's the reaction of the people? They took offense at what he was teaching. But the point of it is here, Jude is brother of James and Jesus. But what does he emphasize? He's a bond servant. He's a bond servant. What is it to be a bond servant? A slave, submissive, willing to choose to serve. So here is someone that had familial relationship with Jesus. What was his relationship while he was growing up and in the part, younger part of Jesus' um, ministry? Was he a great believer? No. They didn't come to believe until later. They kind of discounted Jesus. Uh, maybe they took offense at his messages. Well, you know, he, we grew up, we got, what? What? But what's he emphasized here first and foremost? A bond servant. A bond servant. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 1 that he and Timothy are bond servants. Well, over in, um, we also know that in 2 Peter, Peter calls himself a bond servant. And then James. Also, in James chapter 1, what does he call himself? A bond servant. So these apostles, uh, they are linked to God by virtue of their servanthood. That's what's important. It's not the fact that he was a familial brother of Jesus. Under the law of Moses, did your birthright matter? Sure it did. It mattered who you were. There were different tribes, and certain tribes had certain functions and one thing or another. So being a birthright, being of the same family, was what was important. Under the New Testament, what's important? Is it important about your birthright? Does it matter that you come from a long line of, of, of Christians that, well, my great-grandpappy was the original church member, and, and I come from a long line of church members. Does that make you any closer to God? You mean you can be as close to God in one generation as in 50? Not if you were under the law of Moses. Right? There was, a, there was, there was a, a benefit to having a long lineage under the law of Moses. 
But the point here is, Jude is emphasizing that he is a bondservant of Jesus Christ. We know and we see in Scripture, we talked about that Abraham and uh, Joshua, David, Isaiah, all those folks uh, were all from long lines of lineage. But what was unique about each one of those individuals? How were they characterized in the Skull Testament Scriptures? They were servants. They were servants. They chose that role. So here we see that, that Jude is emphasizing in this first uh, sentence here that he is a bondservant. He has chosen to be here. Now I want to continue on in here, and he says, to those that are called and, to those that are called and kept, right? Kept for Jesus Christ. To those who are called beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. Let's turn over for a moment to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Because I want to look at this idea of called. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, let's start in verse 18. We're going to read down, and we'll do a little bit of reading here today, so just bear with me. I was hoping to get through like six or eight verses, but I think I'm going to have to speed up. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 18, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Let's stop right there for just a brief moment. What is the word of the cross? The power of God. What is it to those that are perishing? Foolishness. Well, how can something be so simple that you can't, that's foolish to think, oh, come on. You ever had anybody tell you that? You're talking to them about God and, and about the Bible. <laughs> you believe that? You are crazy. You are as big a fool as you look. Well, Scripture tells us right here, the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Verse 19, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of the age? Has not, made, has not God made the foolish wisdom, foolish the wisdom of the world? Paul's encouragement for these Corinthians. Remember, the people there at Corinth, they lived in kind of an intellectual society. Well, that's a lot of that going around these days. People want to be intellectual. They want to think about things. They have debaters of ideas. If you, if you turn on any sort of, a, of a, a, a program on TV that has people talking and debating the ideas of the day, well, what's, does Paul remind these Corinthians? What has God done to the wisdom of the day? He's made it foolish. It's foolish. He's made foolish the, the wisdom of the world. 21, for since the wisdom of God, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believed. How much value does the, does the Lord place in the wisdom of the world? Does it have any power to save you? No. No. It is in the message from God. It's a simple message. If you think about it, the message of the Gospels is quite simple, is it not? such that any of us can believe and obey. Well, in verse, verse 22, For indeed Jews ask for signs, and Greeks, Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block, and to Jew, Greeks or to Gentiles foolishness. Well, 
the concept here is that the message of the cross, to some, it's going to be what? A stumbling block. Well, for Jews, what did they have a problem with when it came to Jesus? Ooh, yeah, they wanted an earthly king. They wanted, they wanted signs. Oh, let's have some more fish. Let's have some more healing. Right? And then over here on the Gentiles, the, the Greeks, the Gentiles, however you want to say it, what was their problem? Just not much there. Well, there's nothing here to debate. We've got to have understanding about these things. We've got to have debate these ideas. Well, there's not much here to debate. Verse tw sorry, 25. But the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, and not, not many mighty, not many noble. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and chosen the weak things of the world to, sh to, to shame the things which are strong, and the base things of this world, and the despised God has chosen these things are not, are not so, so that he may, may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. But by doing, by, by doing you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. To that, just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. So our calling, he mentions this back in verse 26, for consider your calling, brethren. What are we called by? What are we called through? The gospel. We are called through the gospel. That's our calling. And what has that gospel done to the world? It's shamed the wise, it's made weak the strong. For those that are lowly, it's made them part of the kingdom of God. Let me ask you a question. What was the occupation of many of the apostles? Fishermen. Were they highly educated individuals? There was only one that I'm aware of that was highly educated. Paul, right? And Paul understood very clearly what it was like to be humbled. Did he not? Where was he? Well, what happened to Paul where he became humbled? He was blinded, wasn't he? So he was humbled and had to be taught by, by others and, and then eventually was, was allowed to see again. So this idea is, I think Paul had a very clear understanding of what it was like to be haughty, right? Was Paul intense? Oh, you bet he was. Was he, uh, was he zealous? You bet he was. I'm going to go get me some Christians. I got letters. Read it. Yep. And it, it's a reminder of exactly what Paul is saying right here, right? I mean, it's, a, it's the gospel is, is a, a shame for those things that we think are wise. So Peter, by hanging on to those things under the law of Moses, he had to be reminded that there's something better that's out here, Peter. You've got to get away from all the things that you've learned before. It did take a while. It, in fact, he kind of fell back into it in Galatia, didn't he? Yeah, Ron?
Right. Lining things up with the Word of God. Yep. Ron's point is that because we are pure, we accept a lot of times think people at face value, do we not? Uh, we, someone comes in and they claim to be such and such. We don't give them the nth degree. Not right away, but we're going to listen to what they say because at the end of the day, the only thing we have is the Word of God. It needs to match up there. So here, and those are good points, and so here, uh, if we look back in Jude, in here, to those, who are, to those who are called, we are called through the gospel. We're called through the word of God. Beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. What does it mean to be kept? What's this word mean here? We use the word kept a lot, don't we? But in various contexts, the word has a lot of different meanings as we use it. But here, this idea is that it is to watch, to watch over, to guard. So for this, in this context, the writer here, Jude, He's saying to those who are called, called by the gospel, and kept or watch over. So let's turn over with me, if you would, to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Get my numbers straight this morning. 15 comes after 8. All right, John chapter 15, let's look at verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. Jesus is speaking here. What is his message about being kept? How are we kept? We abide in the commandments and in Jesus' love, right? We abide there. We keep those commandments. We keep walking in the love of Christ, practicing what he has told us. Well, what else happens here? Just as Jesus, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. So the example is what? Keeping the commandments. Practicing the love. You see, it's, it's not about how we feel about it. It's not about uh, what visions we've seen. It's not about these other factors that are being, being talked about here in the book of Jude. It is, if we are going to be kept, there's one way we're going to be kept for Jesus. And that's if we keep his commandments. We're going to be preserved in his love. Well, what does this mean? Verse 11. These things I have spoken to you so that Whose joy? What's the result of being kept in Jesus? Joy may be made full. Oh, that's a great way to look at it. You mean, does that mean I'm just going to be happy all the time? Rita? Rita?
Yep. Yep. Until the birth of Jesus. Yep. He did it. Abiding in the love of God, abiding in the commandments, right? So here's this idea about joy may be made full. Now, think about the case there that, that Rita has laid out of Joseph and Mary. Was that easy to do what he was doing? I'm sure it wasn't. I'm sure that wasn't. Here's my wife, and okay. So that's not an easy thing, but what is the result here? Joy made full. Does joy always mean you're not going to have any problems? Are these problems going to cause you some distress at times? But the overarching concept here is that we are abiding in the joy of Christ. Did Christ, was every day a bed of roses for Jesus? Well, of course not. All the way right up until the cross, he had some, he had some personal struggles that he had to go through. So here's this idea, it's about the joy would be made full. And I know we're going kind of slow, but there's a, you know, as I read through this, there's a lot of stuff that's really chalked into this first part of, of Jude, that we are called through the word of God and we're kept, we keep his commandments. And the result of that, for all these people just like us today, that as we keep those commandments, our joy grows. And we start to understand those concepts that, that all these trials and tribulation that we go through, it's all for joy. It's all about making me stronger. It's all about helping me reach the final goal. And that's where Jesus is here with his followers. Understand, you're going to struggle. You're going to have hardships. You know, you could go back and look at, at the, the death of most all the apostles. The death of many of those apostles. What about Peter? What about Paul? We don't, we don't know exactly how Paul passed away, but there's other points that did Paul have a lot of struggles in his life? Yeah, he was left for dead two or three times. Right? So here is a situation where it's not going to be physical comforts, and that's where our joy comes from, but it's about keeping the Word of God, keeping our, our mind and our attitude focused on the commandments, doing what God wants, and it, it's pleasing to Him. Oh, verse, well, let's see, we got about two minutes left. I think I'm going to go ahead and read these next verse and the next couple verses and then we'll, we'll pick it up next week. But then in verse 3, or verse 2, may mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. When people are, are well, just in general, what do people of God need? Mercy. Do we need peace? Yeah, we need peace. Peace with? God and love. Do we, need, do we need love multiplied to us? Well, boy, we sure do, because sometimes it's not easy to practice love. He says here in verse 2, may, may, um, may uh, peace, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. And we're going to get into this next week in verse 3, but I wanted to get here. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation... I felt, it the, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. Contend earnestly for the saints. I'm sorry, for the faith. And it was handed down once for all. Okay, so next week we're going to pick up here and I, I will do my best to get through more than two verses next week. Otherwise, we'll be here till next September. Doing, I'm just kidding. Don't saying that people. I'm gonna nobody will come back. So it could happen. Okay. Thank you all very much.